Almost 11 years ago, he became the first Muslim mayor of any large North American city. But after winning three elections, the 36th mayor of Calgary has decided that's enough. And with that, we're joined from the Stampede City by Nahid Nenshi to talk about the past decade in politics and what might come next. Your Worship, it's good to see you again. How are you doing? Well, it's great to see you, Steve. Uh, it has been a long time since we've talked. Uh, and boy, do I ever remember the last time I was on this show. Well, we're going to get to that. Let's not give away the uh, let's not give away the secret just yet. But uh, l let's just start with the most recent development. I mean, everybody seems to think that if you wanted to run again, you could win again. Uh, so why not seek re-election for a fourth time? This was a very difficult decision, uh, and I really went back and forth on it for a very long time. I finally made up my mind on the Thursday before the Easter long weekend, and I announced on Tuesday because I didn't want to backtrack on it. And ultimately, uh, maybe I'll answer the question backwards and tell you why it was a tough decision to, to make. The first was, I really had to ask myself, is it irresponsible? Is it wrong for me to make a move at this pivotal and fragile time in the history of our community and of our nation? And the second question I had to ask myself was, am I fulfilling that promise I made to myself all those years ago, that promise that my parents drummed into me when I was little, which is, am I leaving it better than I found it? Because ultimately right now, everywhere in Canada, but particularly in Calgary, we're going through five simultaneous crises. We've got a public health crisis. We've got a mental health and addictions crisis. We've got an economic crisis. We've got an environmental crisis. And we're finally, I hope, coming to terms with what it actually means to be anti-racist. So I had a lot on my mind as I was thinking about this. But then I also thought, you know, if we've learned one thing over the course of 2020, what we've learned is that even in a fantastically diverse place as Canada and as Calgary, there are so many people who just don't feel that their voices are being heard, that they have a voice in decision making. And there are so many young and new and diverse voices that maybe the right thing is to make some space for those folks to step aside and make some room. I'm, I'm a Gen Xer, and so I'm used to people ahead of me not making room. And I thought maybe this is an opportunity to do that. And the other thing is I was reminded of that speech that I gave on that sweaty, sweaty basement in October of 2010. And the very first line of that victory speech was, today Calgary is different than it was yesterday. It's better than it was yesterday. And it's not because of me, it's because of you. The people in Calgary made a choice back then to, to take a risk on a better future, to be courageous. And I have to remind myself all the time that it's not about the mayor. There's 1.4 million people who live in this city, who love this city, and who are doing extraordinary acts of service and heroism every single day. And so as I move on, I am very confident that that great story of Calgary will continue just with me in a different role. Let me follow up from something, that comment of your parents, which is leave it better than you found it. Are there really any politicians in Canada today because of the coronavirus who can say, I'm leaving it better than I found it? I mean, look, things feel very grim right now, as they should. It's been a very difficult 14 or 15 months for everybody in the community. We've lost a lot. We have a lot to mourn. But I also want to look at the longer arc here. The fact that we get to live in the best place in the world, and I get to live in the best city in the best place in the world. And a lot of things are so much better now than they were 10 or 11 years ago. You know, I always brag that Calgary was named by The Economist again as the most livable city in the entire Western Hemisphere. Uh, and, but the important thing about that is the next two cities on the list, I can't remember the order, but the next two cities on the list were Toronto and Vancouver. And so we've created exceptional places to live, exceptional places to be and raise our family here in Canada. And I really do think that uh, we need to be proud of that and be happy about that more than we are. But the other thing is, to be very practical about it, the election here in Calgary is in October. And I strongly suspect that as long as people continue to get vaccinated, as long as people are disciplined in this home stretch of the coronavirus, things are going to get immeasurably better over the summer and into the autumn. 
And once we put the pandemic behind us, there's going to be a huge opportunity. And that opportunity will be to take a clean slate and to build a stronger, more resilient community. And I think leaders need to take advantage of this opportunity. It's like wet concrete. You can mold it now. And so my goal is to work hard over the next five months. I've got a big to-do list. Uh, get rid of some of the really contentious and difficult issues so that the new mayor and the new council will have a clean slate. They'll be in a post-pandemic world. They'll have a little bit of money in the bank and they'll have the opportunity to craft a new vision for the city. Well, that's you five months from now. I want to take you back to you of 10 years ago because you were on this program shortly after your victory 10 years ago and you had this to say. Tony, if you would, let's roll that clip. Well, I think a lot of people sort of woke up and went, whoa, that does not look like Calgary. Hmm. Uh, and that became an interesting story. And you know, the interesting thing for me was that that whole thing, the color of my skin, my faith, was never part of the election. You know, the, the issue of the uh, racial background never came up. Um, the issue of faith came up, you know, once or twice and was quenched quite quickly. That was your first election. I wonder if you could compare that experience to the last time you ran a few years ago. You know, first of all, I am obsessed with my hair in that clip. You know, the <laughs> hair salons were open then, and yet it seems I didn't want to get a haircut. Uh, so there's a lot less hair uh, and a lot uh, more gray now. But ultimately, things are very different. You know, we have seen a wave of divisiveness and partisanship and anger enter into the public discourse, aided and abetted in many ways by politicians, but now completely out of control. And it is absolutely true that back then, the amount of sort of racist, nasty rhetoric that I would get was very, very rare. I remember spending two or three months debating whether to remove one guy from my Facebook page because he was kind of being a jerk. <laughs> and now, of course, it's every day and relentless. And I see racist attacks against me daily. And certainly that 2017 election was no fun at all. And as I was making my decision on whether to run again, you know, a number of my volunteers and folks who worked on my campaign were actually pretty scarred by that 2017 experience and saying, why would you want to put yourself through that again? And it's, it's a real shame because it has infected, you know, almost every type of political conversation here. Who would have ever thought that public health in a pandemic would become a partisan issue. And there's a lot of blame to go around for this. There's a lot of blame on politicians who stoked this for short-term political gain or who don't have the courage to denounce it. But we are in a situation where, although that is a very small minority, the folks who are that divisive, they are nonetheless a loud minority and they run the risk of really infecting the body politic and we've got to fight against that and we've got to really denounce that and move it out of our system i'll give you a little example you know uh several months ago city council unanimous calgary city council unanimously passed a motion uh, denouncing the use of hate symbols in anti-mask rallies because we were seeing openly racist talk openly racist symbols uh we had people marching carrying torches through downtown Calgary using images of Charlottesville um, to advertise their marches. It was very clear what was going on. And my city council, which really spans the political spectrum, if you believe in political spectrums, unanimously said that's wrong. And so I've been talking about it for a while, but I talked about it recently on a national program. And it was amazing to me the amount of denial that came out of people who were erstwhile leaders, the amount of sympathy for anti-mask protesters. And I was saying, look, you can be anti-restrictions, you can be anti-mask, but if you go to one of these rallies where people are wearing hate group insignias, you're just empowering them. And so it doesn't take any political courage at all for someone to say, actually, I denounce those people. I don't want them at my rally. I don't want them as part of my conversation. And I'm going to figure out different ways of making my point against these restrictions. But instead, what we heard was a lot of denial, a lot of, oh, the mayor sees ghosts where there are none. And that kind of behavior is what strengthens and empowers this uh, terrible hatred. Well, there's no question that the anonymity of social media empowers people to be their most disgraceful selves. 
But I wonder if, well, let me get you to address this. Is it possible as well that maybe Marinenshi, Calgary, Alberta, and Canada aren't the places you thought they were? You know, that's something that people should be worried about, but I don't think it's true. I think that you've always had a minority of people who feel this way. And anyone who grows up as a person of color in this community, as a racialized person in this community, knows that the existence that we live is a slightly different existence than other Canadians. But at the same time, we have extraordinary opportunity here. And I think this has been really hard for a lot of Canadians, especially as we've been struggling with a new conversation about anti-racism. It's been hard for me. So when we had our anti-racism hearings at Calgary City Hall last summer, so many people came and told us stories of their lived experience in Calgary, especially young people. And a lot of my colleagues, a lot of my white colleagues, were surprised by what they were hearing, that that level of racism exists in our community. I wasn't surprised because it's also the lived experience of every person of color here. But at the same time, I said to myself, you know what, when I have young people in their 20s telling stories that I could have told in my 20s or my friends could have told in, in our 20s, and that was a long time ago, hence the gray hair, how come we haven't progressed? And so to me, it really comes down to, can we simultaneously hold in our hands the fact that we are proud of what we've built here? that we're proud of this diverse and pluralistic and multicultural place, and we have every right to be proud of it. We should be proud of it because we've built something here that is very hard to come by in most parts of the world throughout human history. But can we hold in our hands at the same time the fact that we're proud of that, but that we've got work to do, that it's not enough to strive to be not racist. We have to move on a journey that we don't know towards what it means to be truly anti-racist. So let me put it to you this way. The young people were telling us that they're not sure that they want to abide by the deal anymore. And here's the deal that people of color have made implicitly or explicitly in our nation, which is we'll put up with it. We'll put up with the fact that the security guard at the mall, even though he looks like us, will pay special attention to us while we're at the mall. We'll put up with, how do you pronounce your name? Where are you from? No, no, I mean, where are you really from? <laughs> we'll put up with a different relationship with the police. We'll put up with uh, a very different lecture that parents give their kids when they get their driver's license for kids of color versus white kids. We'll put up with all of that because in return, we get to live in the best place in the world and we get to live in a place of boundless and endless opportunity. But yet, I think a lot of young people in particular are saying, well, that's the deal my parents or my grandparents made. I'm not sure I want to live with that deal. I want to live in a place where I don't live a slightly different life than everyone else. And to me, that's what it means to move on this journey towards anti-racism. It's scary. I don't know where it's going to end up. I don't know what we have to give up in order to get there, but I know we have to do it. I want to raise another difficult issue with you. And I actually remember where you were when you had to declare one of the three states of emergency that happened on your watch. I wonder if you remember. I'm, I'm, I'm guessing from the comments you made off the top, you do remember where you were when it happened. I remember that Friday very, very well. Friday in June uh, in 2013, when I had given a breakfast speech in Toronto, and I had a whole series of speeches and events I was doing right up until 11 p.m. that night before I went to a friend's wedding in St. Catharines, Ontario. And in the middle of that breakfast speech, uh, I was informed that we were about to have the largest flood in Calgary's history. And so I had to manage that flood uh, the first several hours of it while I was in Toronto until I felt that it was comfortable to be out of touch for a few hours on a plane in order to be able to fly back. But I'm very polite because I'm Canadian. So I didn't want to cancel all of my appointments. And it's not every day you get a chance to be on the agenda. <laughs> so I took the subway up to Young and Eglinton and uh, was doing calls with our emergency operations center in the green room of your studio. And I believe that I actually declared that state of local emergency 
in your studio just before or just after I got on uh, got on set with you. So that's, that's exactly a, right. On your cell a phone. Day that I will never forget. Um, <laughs> but you know what? We have in the long history of Calgary, we have declared three states of local emergency in 136 years. And lucky me, I got to be the mayor for all three of them. <laughs> so in some ways, maybe I'm just terrible luck. <laughs> well, okay. What's what's something you didn't get done in Calgary that you really wish you could have? And even though there's five months left, you know you're not going to get it done. Well, there's a lot that I'm still going to try to get done, uh, including uh, trying to secure a historic investment in affordable housing, because I truly believe that with a relatively modest investment from the federal and provincial governments, we could actually end homelessness in Calgary in the next two years. We're at a unique point in our economy and our history where we could do that, but we need the political will and the money to be able to move forward. My biggest regret though, I think is, and my biggest failing as a political leader, I think is the discussion around the Olympics. You know, we really had a terrific opportunity there to do something very special for Canada. And because of politics, because frankly of bickering between the different orders of government, we weren't able to get that one over the line. And when I look back on my career, I wish I had taken a much stronger hand and much better political leadership in helping people see the advantage of that. Because right now, if we want to maintain our own the podium status, if we want to maintain high performance athletics in this country, we're going to have to spend a bunch of money on refurbishing our 40 year old facilities uh, that those athletes use in Calgary, but we're not going to get an Olympics at the end of it. And I think that's a shame. Hmm. You are leaving office uh, much younger than most people who do your work leave office. I, I, you're not even 50 yet, I don't think. And not quite. So you've got a lot of thinking to do about what presumably comes next. Have you figured that out yet? I have no idea. Um, and it actually feels scary and sort of good. Um, I pride myself on being a strategist, on kind of knowing what the next three moves on the game board are. And it's very rare for me to just sort of open myself up to the world and open myself up to opportunities. You know, anyone who's heard me talk in Calgary over the last several years will be familiar with a word that I always use. The word is seva. And in many South Asian languages, seva means service, selfless service. And so I always talk about how we are all called upon to do service, how we are all called upon to be seva baris. And so I'll figure out a way to do service outside of elected office. Um, I will figure out a way, I hope, uh, humbly hope to be part of the story of Calgary and Canada going forward. I think I've got another chapter or two in me. I just have no idea what that's going to be. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, as I keep telling people, I am told that I have missed 10 years of very good television. So in addition to getting caught up on lots of back episodes of the agenda, um, I hear there's something called Game of Thrones that might be worth my time. So that might be where we start. Mad Men and Breaking Bad are also very good for what it's worth. Thank you. Um, okay, well, you said in non-elective office, and that obviously prompts a follow-up, which is lots of people are trying to get you to run for them, including, I presume, the current prime minister of the country. Have you ruled out going federal? Well, you know, never say never, but um, I've been so lucky that my first job in politics was the best job in politics. You know, I was on a, I was on a U.S. podcast recently where they said, are you interested in seeking higher office? And I said, there is no higher office than being the mayor. Am I interested in seeking lower office? Not really, no. Um, but, <laughs> you know, I am interested in making sure that we tackle the burning issues of our time. Economic prosperity, environmental crisis, mental health crisis, and figure out ways in which to do that. But here's my challenge. You know, uh, working from home, I'm not wearing a tie very often, but I still wear purple every day. I've been wearing purple every day for so many years. And the reason for that is because purple is red and blue, because I want to remind people that we're not partisans, we're human beings who share community and share land, and we've got to figure out how to work together on this land. I'm not convinced there's a lot of room for purple in our legislatures and in Parliament right now. Uh, but I think there are lots and lots of ways to be able to tackle some of those big, meaty issues in different ways. And, you know, maybe years from now, political office might be the right way to go, but 
for now, you know, Game of Thrones, Mad Men, and Breaking Bad, I'm told. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, I also note another municipal leader from the province of Alberta that we've had on our program, Don Iveson, who's, whose politics I think are pretty much in line with yours. Uh, he's not running again either. Uh, does that open up any possibilities for you two to work together in something? Well, he and I were just doing a joint interview uh, and I revealed our secret plans, which is that we are going to start a new roller derby league in Alberta. He's going to be the general manager of the Edmonton team. I'm going to be the general manager of the Calgary team, and it's going to be awesome. Um, no, seriously, Don and I, interestingly, have been friends for about 20 years, long before either of us got into politics, just as kind of young bucks, he's much younger than I am, uh, who wanted to change the system. So I have very good faith that we haven't seen the last of Don Iveson, and he's going to be a big part of the story going forward as well. But you two aren't setting up some kind of consulting company or something going forward. Now we'd probably kill each other. Got but it. Now that you Got mention it. it. <laughs> is it a given that you will stay in Alberta? You know, Calgary is my home. Um, my family is here. I've got a lot of continuing work to do here. Um, before I was the mayor of Calgary, I led sort of a more international life. Uh, and even as mayor, I've had the opportunity to do a lot of stuff on the global stage that maybe most mayors don't have the chance to do. But Calgary will always be my base, and hopefully Calgary will always be my home. Inshallah, did, as we Muslims say. Inshallah. Uh, I want to ask you uh, about a guy who really uh, is quite an extraordinary politician. Uh, he had a very successful federal career. He managed to take two rather disparate political parties and put them together and then win an election with, I think, the highest percentage of the total vote maybe in Alberta history. I'm talking, of course, about I the don't, current... I don't think in history, but a very high proportion, yeah. A very high proportion, okay. I'm talking, of course, about Jason Kenney, whose, whose popularity numbers right now are, are really in the toilet. And, uh, you know, again, this is an Ontario audience mostly that you're speaking to right now. Can you explain for us... Because you guys go through premiers there like you know what through a goose. I think, you've, what, have there been six while you've been the mayor? Six. six. Okay. Can you explain how it works out there that, that this guy who was so utterly popular and king of the hill not that long ago is today fighting for his political life? Well, you know, before I was a politician, I was a pundit. And ever since I've been a politician, I've been told I'm not allowed to do punditry. And it is a rule that I ignore constantly. So thank you so much for giving me the chance. Um, <laughs> You know, the problem is that the United Conservative Party is not particularly united. And there are folks in that party who on the federal scene probably wouldn't be in the same party. And so it is difficult at the best of times to hold together that coalition. You know, the, the old PCs in Alberta were a very, very big tent. So you would have basically, you would absolutely have Doug Ford and Kathleen Wynne to use uh, Ontario example, in the same party. And that party would make a lot of its decisions within the party instead of in a more open democratic process. And, you know, it fractured into two parties. The NDP came up the middle and won an election to a lot of people's surprise, including I think their own. And so the prospect of what Premier Kenny was offering, let's go back to the good old days, let's make Alberta great again, if I can coin a phrase, <laughs> um was very very intriguing but the world has changed and so it's been quite difficult for the premier to maintain you know a good stance on public health that really appeals to the vast majority of the people in alberta but may not appeal to the fringe of his party uh, he recently had to expel two mlas quite frankly there's two or three others that i'm shocked you're still in the caucus and he has been dealing with insurrection within his own party from the very beginning and I think the other thing he learned that all of us learned is being a cabinet minister is one thing, spending your entire adult life in politics or adjacent to politics gives you a certain set of skills, but it doesn't necessarily bring you the managerial and leadership skills you need to actually run the place. And it's not that easy and you have to be able to climb a very steep learning curve. And when you have a pandemic jump at you, you know, not even a year after you've been elected, that learning curve gets very hard. Well, Mernenshi, if you ever do want to do punditry again, I would recommend it because you're darn good at it. 
Uh, we thank you for spending so much time on the agenda with us over the years, because this is certainly not your first visit to our program. And we wish you well with whatever comes next for you. Well, thank you so much. Um, and again, as tough as things look now, just remember to live in gratitude of this extraordinary place we live. And by the way, if you are a woman or a black or indigenous or a person of color who wants to get into politics, don't let this story make you run away. We need to hear your voice. We want to have you involved. And it's my job and the job of so many others to make that path easier for you. That's Nahid Nenshi, 36th Mayor of Calgary, Alberta. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.